questions, then I will go back to this table. Uh, and then uh, I should tell you what are arbitrary singularities because this is actually very nice. So if you think about singularity types, then, well, what could you do? You could probably uh, think about uh, completions of local rings and that's like one method. So you start from a singularity type. A singularity type should be some kind of an equivalence relation on pointed schemes. So you may declare uh, those to be equivalent if and only if the complete local rings at X and Y are equivalent. I mean, are isomorphic, but that's kind of not really stable. So you would also like to define that you can add arbitrary number of parameters, okay? So this is one definition. And the second, which is uh, equivalent, uh, is more geometric and goes by Artin's approximation. The equivalence, I mean, uh, is that you define those pointed schemes to be of the same singularity type, if and only if you have a common smooth neighborhood. So everything here is pointed and uh, you can see directly that we only care about the point X. So this is all very local. Mm. All right, so this is, this is the singularity type. So by definition, uh, uh, singularity type uh, is a class uh, of those pointed schemes under uh, this relation. So the examples that you should keep in mind are, well, you could consider the class of, of FP with, with its unique point. And if you have an X here, then this exactly means that, uh, that the local ring has characteristic P and apart from that, that it is smooth. Well, regular. Mm, that's one example to keep in mind. And perhaps the other one is the non-reduced point. And again, uh, you could check that here. If you have a scheme here, then this at least implies that, the, uh, that Y in Y is non-reduced. Uh, okay, and one thing that is important and this, which is really tricky here, uh, that I haven't still told you what are X and Y here for those singularity types. And for this to actually happen, I mean, I could define those singularity types for every scheme, but to obtain those singularity types, I need to assume that X over Z uh, is of, well, locally finite type or finite type. So my singularity type is by definition, the singularity type of something that is of finite type over Z. So in particular, it doesn't really have any type of information that is transcendental or that lies in C or things like that. Okay, and then- uh, Oh, sorry, can I ask the, a question? Sure. Uh, in, in the second Maybe example- I scroll, yeah. Mm -hmm. In the second example, you said, okay, so if the this kind of pair belongs to that class, if th this is just only if, right? It's not, is it reverse? Well, no, it's, I mean, this uh, is, this contains more information than just being non reduced because, uh, well, yeah. the class of uh, a triple yeah, yeah, point yeah. is not here. Right, right, right. Yeah. You should think yeah. of this as like being smooth uh, up to this point, up to, up to this single non-reduced variable. Yeah, great, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so let me just rephrase the Ravi's result, uh, which is to say that for every sigma, a singularity type, in the above sense, there exists a point 
z on some Hilbert scheme. So maybe there exists a p and a point z on the Hilbert scheme uh, such that this Hilbert scheme with the given point belongs to our class. And additionally, um, we can assume that the degree of p is uh, fixed, so that the, for perhaps for every uh, d and for every p of degree d, uh, we have this. And additionally, what is what is really nice and important, we can assume that z is smooth. So really, we are considering the formations of a smooth projective variety, uh, and those can have arbitrary singularities. Maybe so the, the Mumford degree is greater than zero. Here? Is that right? Uh, is yeah. That what thanks. About? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thanks. Mm. All right. And I definitely don't want to give a proof, but I want to give a sketch of a proof to, uh, to really justify why do we need this assumption. And uh, the proof goes by a series of really nice reductions. I, I mean, I really uh encourage you to to look at this paper because there are there is lots of nice geometry there uh, but suppose we would like to understand curves so then uh, there is the, some kind of a slicing trick that is attributed to Fantecchi and Pardini that says that if we start from a surface say and uh, if we start from, if we take a hypersurface uh, of, of large enough degree, uh, then under good assumptions, we can consider the map from the Hilbert scheme times the Hilbert scheme, at least locally defined to the Hilbert scheme that takes this S and H and maps it to the intersection. And this map pi is uh, smooth near uh, the intersection. I think the surface should be smooth here, and that's about it. About uh, so, therefore, if you already start from a surface that is nice, so nice means that the Hilbert scheme at this surface has the appropriate singularity type, then you can deduce that the Hilbert scheme of uh, the intersection also has the same singularity type. Can I ask what you, what, what does it mean to say that pi is smooth near S intersect H? Are you thinking of S? Oh, I'm thinking pi? about those uh, as the points of the Hilbert scheme. And I'm saying that pi is defined uh, near and being defined near it's smooth. So I'm just saying that every okay. deformation of the curve induces the deformation of the surface and the hyperplane. Uh, the hyperplane. S intersect H, you're thinking of that as a point of the of the target space, is it? Uh, yeah, I mean, here I'm thinking about the Hilbert scheme of curves here. Okay, so and, you mean smooth? You mean the, the it's smooth above above that point? You mean is that what? Yeah, I'm. I'm uh, yeah, smooth. The, it's smooth at the points in the pre-image of this. Is it? Yeah, and okay. I should say that I'm cheating here a lot. So you should perhaps complain more about the cheating than because uh, I'm just trying okay. to, yeah. The argument actually like, has, yeah. Okay, this so part, it's, it's uh, smooth, not, not just at, at the point S comma H, but it's smooth at all the points that map to S intersect H. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, uh, to be precise, I'm. I'm saying that here I have an open subset containing S uh, comma H that, uh, so, so that if I intersect with this open subset, then I get smooth map. Oh, okay. So, so I guess sounds... I'm not saying this about all the points that map to S comma oh, H okay. because so I'm only smooth. interested in local behavior. Okay, okay, I, I see. So you're saying that pi is smooth at the point S comma H then? Uh, right, that's perhaps a better way to phrase this. Uh, um, yeah, in any case, pi is only rational. So I'm not really saying where pi is defined, so. Okay, thank you. 
Mm -hmm. Because if the intersection is bad, then uh, we don't. Okay, so, well, the important point uh, is that uh, this uh, step uh, fails uh, for uh, as a curve. So if we if we try to uh, see uh, where the theorem really, uh, I mean, how the theorem could be extended to the equals zero, then we would have a similar step starting from a curve and intersecting with a hyperplane. And then, well, this step will tell you that there exists some kind of a curve so that if we intersect with a hyperplane and you get a bunch of points, uh, because that's like a general intersection here, then every deformation of this bunch of points should induce a deformation of the hyper uh, surface and the curve itself. So that's in the case of the hyperplane, as I've drawn it, uh, that you can see immediately that this is wrong because you can move those points randomly around and they will definitely de-align from any hyperplane. So this step just fails and there is a technical reason for that, but perhaps the geometric can you please repeat okay. the point? So what you, you intersect the curve with the hyperplane and then what can you say again? Yeah, I mean, I, suppose I want to treat this as a black box and I'm okay. hoping that maybe I can extend the proof uh, for the case where I want to obtain here points, right? So suppose mm -hmm. I want to obtain here something zero dimensional, then I have to start from a curve. Oh, I see, you're so, saying that I can choose a hyper, hyperplane so that the intersection is not so the same. Right, it's H is a hypersurface, so in a large enough re-embedding, I can think of it as a hyperplane. And then I have this geometric picture that should tell me that all the deformation of a tuple of points contains some kind of an, some kind of data about S. Okay, thank you. Yet another way of phrasing is this is that this tuple of points should somehow have an idea about what is S and what are the deformation of S even worse. And those points really don't have that idea because they deform independently. We are thinking about the deformation of each point separately. So the deformation type is just smooth. Like there are no obstructions to deforming points. So this step fails. Um, okay. And uh, I should advertise the first open problem here. Uh, namely, the open problem is about the theorem for degree p equal to one. And then for degree p equal to one, we get in the theorem, we get curves that are smooth, but so that the, so we get curves in p n and uh, so that this Hilbert scheme with appropriate point, uh, has this appropriate singularity type, but on the other hand, this is smooth. So you know that the deformation of C, abstract deformations are also smooth or unobstructed. Simply because abstract deformations of any smooth curves are unobstructed because by general nonsense, the obstruction group vanishes. So the obstruction here is really lying in the embedding the embedding has to be obstructed, otherwise it's not so. And so the open problem is if we consider curves, not smooth, so not normal, over FP, can we actually find such curves so that uh, C uh, does not lift to characteristic zero? That's like a problem that is, of, I think, of interest. And perhaps at least I've heard some people saying that it should follow. I don't see quite how, so I think that's still open. And if you are looking for example, then you can assume, assume C uh, irreducible and rational. So it's not like a it's not like a some crazy curve. It's just some kind of a curve with a, some pretty complicated self-intersection at the origin. So I'd be very happy to talk about this more, but I have little idea on how to do this, but I think this should be a fine uh, thing to do. 
It's okay. Like, this is a great right. question. I feel like the answer, if you think about it one way, is obviously yes, and the answer from another point of view is obviously no. So it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting question. Okay, well, I so far I've only tried the answer obviously and now, uh, oh, sorry, obviously yes, starting from the result on the Hilbert scheme, but uh, it didn't take us long, so yeah. Can I ask you this question, are, is C, is C um, in this non-normal curve, is it, is it assumed to be reduced or, is it, or not, not even that? Oh yeah, I'm I'm thinking about reduced. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry about oh, okay. if I do non-reduced, then I can just make a zero-dimensional thing and multiply it by i1. Yeah, that's what so. I was yeah, thinking. thanks, okay. thanks. That's uh, yeah. So maybe I should say integral simply. Okay. So like okay. a curve, okay. but it's just with you can also assume how uh, you can also assume like one single singularity. Uh, so it's really it's really about the point here. Uh, all right. So therefore, I would like to say a few more today about the theorem that says that uh, the Hilbert scheme of D points, actually the disjoint union of all the Hilbert scheme of D points on A sixteen, uh, has all singularity types, but only up to retraction. Uh, I don't think I want to define what does it mean up to retraction right now. Uh, you could probably, oops, sorry, ret retraction. Uh, you could probably ignore this part for the time being. It, we will see how it really uh, shows up. And in particular, uh, it is non-reduced. That's one thing, and it has uh, singularities. Uh, sorry, it has uh, components in characteristic p for all p, and it also has all all other sorts of strange things like algebras that lift to rings with p to the 1000 non zero, but uh, they do not lift any further. So you, you, you have also, I mean, this after retraction doesn't really change the, the situation too much. Mm, okay. Uh, so, how should we do this? Well, the first, the first step was made in, by uh, Erman in 2012. And he actually geometrized the trick that was just being shown here, or rather algebraized it. Uh, so instead of considering intersections in projective space, uh, he went to cones. So he actually said that if we have like a cone over the above surface, so maybe I will write this. So if we have this uh, surface in projective space, then we can consider the ideal the homogeneous ideal sitting in inside, and then uh, we can truncate it uh, in a large enough degree where large enough is uh, connected to the regularity. And if we do this carefully, and if we also truncate a bit here, I guess, to be uh, short, then we get that the deformation of S uh, are equivalent to the deformation of this truncated ideal. Sorry, what do you mean by truncation? Uh, by truncation, I mean I add all the the maximal ideal to some high power. So in terms, of, if you think about the Hilbert series, then we just truncate everything in the, from degrees e plus two on. So yeah, and geometrically you had this cone that I'm definitely unable to draw and you just intersect it with a large enough neighborhood of the origin. So you are actually just pretending that you have a zero dimensional thing, uh, but uh, you start with the cone. And 
Okay, so the deformations in of S, I guess it's safer to put in PN here. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, how looking at, I, at your ideal, should I guess it's a cone? Oh, this is a homogeneous ideal. So okay. it's just, uh, it just uh, defines the cone over S inside uh, AN. Okay, cool. Plus one. Mm, so yeah, so the, so you get the deformations of this. And since the deformations are homogeneous, then actually you get that this is the same thing as the deformation of the ideal above, but only at the homogeneous level. Okay, so basically having homogeneous deformations uh, enables you to go back to the projective geometry situation. So somehow the moral uh, from here is that uh, GM equivariant uh, gives you some kind of O of one. I, I tend to, to make this moral fake, but the way you should think about this is that this scheme is zero dimensional. So line bundles are trivial and that's the main problem here. Line bundles on any other, I mean, in the higher dimensions are non-trivial and having an embedding into PN, we get a line bundle and this non-trivial line bundle gives us information. But here on in the zero dimensional world, line bundles are trivial, so they contain no information, but well, line, uh, having an O of one line bundle is essentially having something that comes from a shift in degrees so if we keep the degrees fixed, then we get um, enough reasonable structure of this O of one bundle. Okay. Um, so therefore uh, I should formulate the theorem by Erman. And the theorem just says that if you consider the Hilbert scheme of D points on A N, and I guess that this N should be like five, but maybe let me just put this to be on the safe side, then it has all uh, singularity types. So for every singularity type, you can have you can have this point, but only if you consider the GM equivariant deformations. So this GM equivariant part is very important. Okay, so let me maybe pause a bit for the questions, if there are any other. I, I'm afraid that I cannot hear the question. There is some kind of sound. If you want to type it in the chat, Bigella, then I can read it out if you want, if that helps. Joachim. Can you explain again mm -hmm. why uh, this this story about the truncating ideal gives you all the singularities? Oh, sure. Uh, I mean, I'm I haven't explained it yet, so I won't explain it again. Ah. I will just explain it for the first time. Uh, but well, the the whole idea is that we really remember about Ravi's result that you can have a surface in P n of arbitrary singularity type or a curve if you prefer, that's not a problem, but I will stick to, to S being a surface. So you fix a singularity type, you fix S, and then you say that you have, you can cook up this J, which is the truncation, so that the deformation of S and of J are equivalent. So geometrically you say, you start with the deformation of the surface, you take the deformation of the cone, and then you take the deformation of the truncated cone, and all those things are equivalent. Nice. But only if you consider GM equivalent deformation. And I can ask Michaela's question, which is, uh, is it known if they're generically non-reduced components? Mm, I think the now I'm, would like to know for which moduli space. Uh, because I think the answer is yes. Uh, okay, the answer is yes, nevertheless. 
for, for A16. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, for A16. Uh, yeah, so let me go back uh, a bit. Uh, sorry, here. Uh, yeah, so this after retraction does not imply that they exist generically non reduced components, but they do. We do this, we know this from this subsequent work with my student. So, yeah, the, uh, the answer to the question is that we even know things like uh, Hilbert scheme of 21A4 uh, has generically non reduced components. Okay, so that's like, uh, but this does not follow because this uh, retraction could mess up with being non reduced and generically non reduced. Okay. Mm. Okay. So, if so there are no more, so I guess that mm -hmm. this, is an, this is an announcement of a new result, right? I was unaware of it. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. So, I, I hope to come there at some point. But yeah, that this uh, this is actually well, the main credit should go to the. Macaulay 2 program and some of the lemmas that will show up. So maybe I will say a few more words about that uh, later on. I mean, this generic and unreduced component is something somehow the most crude singularity type. So it's not that hard to show that it exists. Uh, well, okay. Uh, okay, any more questions? Okay, if not, then maybe let me make my notation lighter a bit. So I will write H instead of help from that point on. And I will frequently ignore uh, those summations over N and D or over D. Uh, if there are any confusions, I hope they, will, they won't be. But if there are, then let me know. And then, well, we have, we have this. So Having the result of Erman, what we do? We have this H of dn, the fixed points, which is, by the way, nothing else, just to be on the same. This is nothing else but having uh, ideals that are homogeneous. So this is nothing mysterious here. And this sits inside the whole space of ideals. Well, homogeneous and of appropriate size of the quotient. Uh, and we have this embedding. And we would like to compare the singularity type of this and this. Obviously, like a priori, there is nothing, nothing that can compare them. Like, we can have uh, GM fixed points of a smooth variety that are non reduced, well, of a, sorry, not a smooth, of a, of a singular reduced variety that are non reduced and stuff like that. We really, we really don't have any control on the, on the variety itself, knowing only the GM points. Okay, so we would really want this map to be dominant. Well, but this is insane uh, because if you take any uh, homogeneous ideal, then it certainly can deform to a non-homogeneous ideal simply because we have like coordinate changes. And those coordinate changes really mess up with the homogeneity of the ideal. But and, and anyhow, you can believe that having this map dominant is insane, I hope. Uh, so let us do another insane thing and hope that as in physics, the insaneness will cancel out and we will be left with uh, a reasonable result. So, well, algebraic topology tells us that if we have like a map that it's not dominant, then we can have like a five branch replacement for it. That will be dominant. And in particular, uh, we would like to understand this idea here and this five branch replacement 
in algebraic topology uh, goes by the name of the path space. So very surprisingly, path space exists also in algebraic geometry. They go by totally different name and they are not really path spaces, but they are exactly the equivalent that we would like to uh, investigate. And those are the Bialynicki Birola decomposition. I guess normally someone will step in and correct the pronunciation of the speaker of the name, but in this case, I don't think it will. Okay, so so what would we like to do here? Uh, by the way, you should. This is com this is a tool, but it's completely disconnected to Hilbert scheme. If you don't like Hilbert schemes, you should uh, start listening again, because this is useful. So we start from a torus as before. So I will even introduce a coordinate, uh, and we start from it's actually a projective variety. This projective assumption is really to make things easy for me, not to uh, not for any other reasons. And then we can define this x plus, and this is the definition of the of the uh, BB decomposition. And this x plus is just defined as a space of maps from a1 to x that are GM equivariant. And if you want to think about this path space uh, for a moment, then you should compare this with the maps from the interval to x in topology. OK, and um, therefore, uh, it's a factor so far. Uh, and there is a theorem due to Dreenfeld and with a very, very slight uh, relaxation of assumptions due to myself and my student Lukas Sienkiewicz that says that uh, H plus is uh, representable. Oops, that shouldn't be bold. Uh, maybe it is, but not really uh, at this top. is representable uh, for all X of locally finite type. And representable means by a scheme. Nothing, nothing fancy here. Mm, aha, and I should say that uh, you may wonder whether this projective does not imply immediately locally of finite type, and the answer is obviously yes. So here, uh, being projective is unnecessary. Here, this this being locally of finite type is really important. Uh, okay, so we have this map, and. Before I go into detail how it really looks like, let me just say that it comes from the usual structure. So we can forget to X and we can forget to GM and we have a section. So if you if you think about mapping spaces for algebraic topology, maybe that's clear. If not, then this is definitely not clear. So let me explain this diagram, but it's like the fundamental diagram. Mm. Uh, so to explain, let me think about points. So on points, uh, I have a map from A1 to X and this is GM equivariant. So in terms of geometry, well, I have this map and it sends the unit element to some specific point X. Then it has to be equivariant, which means that all the other points are sent to GM apart from one single point that is sent to something that lies in the closure of GM. So actually the image of this map is the closure of the orbit, well, a partial closure perhaps of the orbit of X. Mm, and therefore I can simply take this map and map it to phi of one or take this map and map it to phi of zero here. 
And for really technical reasons, I would really prefer to stick to GM union infinity. You should ignore this. You can think about zeros. That would be important only, only on the technical level. So I have those maps and uh, I also want to have the map in the opposite direction. So if I start with a fixed point, I can cook up like a map to X that is constant. Okay, uh, any questions on this structure? Because that's kind of that, that is one diagram that you could remember from ABB decomposition and it should give you all the other properties. Uh, Sorry, so, so is one of the two values the limit value? Um, or I should write. Yeah, uh, I'm evaluating at infinity and at one. So one is this x and the infinity is this uh, thing that you would really want, well, you could really think about the limit mm -hmm. of x uh, as t goes to infinity, because this is a point that lies in the closure of the orbit and the orbit is parameterized by t. Mm -hmm. So topologically, yeah, topologically, this is the limit. And so topologically, this, this map can be denoted as passing to the limit. Nice. So, so here, do you really need x to be projective or proper? Uh, no, I don't. But yeah, the observation that you are probably correctly uh, making is that x uh, plus 2x is uh, bijective uh, and this requires x proper. If x proper, then every point has a limit. So every point can be lifted to x plus. So if x is not proper, then this map is maybe non-bijective. It actually may be bijective because the, the action can be kind of contracting everything. If you think about the usual action, on a n, and if you think about the limit at zero, then everything has a limit, because just nothing would go to the boundary if you think about the p n. Mm. All right. Mm. So, mm. so this is the structure that we have, and maybe for a moment, I should tell you why this is actually called Belnitsky Birula decomposition, because there is a theorem from the 73rd that is formulated in completely different language that says that if X is smooth, and I think I better put projective here as well, maybe, maybe complete, a smooth complete variety, then X plus decomposes as a union of uh, connected components. Uh, the fixed point set also decomposes as a union of connected components. Everything here is smooth. That's part of the theorem. And the most important part is that the limit map from X plus to XGM that is just given on each of those components is algebraic, uh, that's by construction and is uh, an affine fiber bundle. Can I ask, uh, yep. can I ask about the thing in green again? Um, sure. It, I mean, is it, is it really a bijection when X is proper? I was, I was just thinking about the example you were giving where everything is contracted. If, if X were projective space, mm -hmm. and if, okay, if so this, maybe, it, yeah, I was just about to do this example. So let me do this, but maybe just for the sake of me being naive, let me take the projective line. That's fine. Yeah, right. so then. Okay. Um, no, no, oh, no, I, I want, I want, I, I need, I, I want P, P, P2, how about P2? Uh, all right, that's, yeah, maybe then, I will you have different, help. Could you have mm -hmm. different maps from A1 um, that all have, I mean, tending to, tending to the origin in different directions? Is that, is that right, but the 
the map here, the I map, is the map that takes the po that evaluates at one, which means that this I map takes your oh, right. okay. map and returns the point X. Oh, sorry, I was confusing the I and the pi. Okay, yeah, all right, thank you. Yeah, so, okay. So maybe let me do the example that should be clarifying anyhow, but I will do P1, sorry. I'm only able to do P1. And then the, the with the usual action, so then the limit at infinity of any point is well. Either this is just infinity if x is non-zero, or this is zero if x is zero. So this implies that actually x plus decomposes into p1 minus uh, zero. That's one of the component. And then there is this joint union zero. So this is why it's called the decomposition. On the points you have bijection, but you really have different connected components. All right, and uh, yeah, since I'm really a bit out of time, so maybe I will not say mu much more about this affine, bar affine fiber bundle, because the point is that this Bernitsky birula theorem is up for smooth varieties. And the decomposition for non smooth varieties is indeed only due to Dreenfeld, and I think this is 2000. 13. So there was like a 40 year gap between the result of Bianiski Birula for smooth and the result for of Dreamford for any. Uh, all right, so then uh, let me give you just some vague idea about how the proof of the theorem uh, of myself on the Hilbert scheme goes. So we start as usually from a singularity type. And we realize it using Ravi's result as the singularity type of the Hilbert scheme at the surface S itself. And then we would like to perform this reduction and we do it, but now we need to take care about two things. So we want to reduce uh, S to dimension zero, whatever that means. Uh, but so that to obtain say R, but so that if we consider the Bianitsky birula decomposition of H, and if we consider the map from the Bianitsky birula decomposition of H onto H, then this should be this should be an open immersion near R. So in terms of this P1 thing that will pretend to be the Hilbert scheme, we have the Bialinsky Birula decomposition of P1. It has this open part which is indeed an open immersion into P1 under, under this I map. And then we have this single point, which definitely does not give an open immersion. So we would like to have this reduction of S, keeping somehow the deformation type of S, but also we would like to keep this open immersion thing going on. So we need two conditions and uh, those two conditions are kind of, none of them is really uh, explicit so far. I mean, this S, we don't have any control over it. Uh, and also we don't yet know how to show that something is an open immersion near R. So we have two problems, I guess. And, uh, Okay, so the second problem can be resolved. Namely, there is the key lemma for BB decompositions that tells you the following. You start with your point X on X, which is an abstract variety with GM. And suppose you have this uh, the point is fixed, 
Then you have the GM action on the tangent space. And actually, you can deduce that the tangent space of x at x plus, where x in x plus is actually the, the section, is the non negative part of the tangent space of the whole point. And now the lemma says that if you have a surjection on the tangent spaces, then you win. So the following are equivalent. The tangent space to x plus is the tangent space to whole x. And the map i to i is an open immersion near x. So therefore, we really win because the tangent space to the Hilbert scheme is one of the few things that we can control for a moduli space. So that's great news. Uh, and the only thing left is to control the singularity type and the tangent space at the same time. So we would, we would need to have this condition, which boils down to the condition of having no negative weights and the appropriate singularity type. Right. So uh, in your example of P1, you like the pi 1 minus 0 component and you don't like the 0, right? Exactly, because I want to be able to identify P1 plus with P1. Uh, and I should tell you why, and that should be probably the last thing that I will be able to do. Namely, if I know that I have this H plus and if I, if I know that I have this map that is an open immersion, of course, always only near R, then what we, what we do have is this retraction. So using this open immersion and using this retraction, I know uh, that the singularity types of uh, R in H and of the same R, but in HGM are related up to retraction. Okay, because I can essentially ignore this map thinking about the singularity type since it's an open immersion and I only get this retraction. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and maybe since I really have like one minute for a technical part, which is great, maybe I should tell you how to do this. Uh, and it would be a bit ugly, but there will be some geometric question, which I'd be very happy to know answer to. Namely, the algorithm is pretty explicit. Uh, you start with an with a ideal S, I, and you could think of this as the ideal of your surface in n variables, and maybe I want to index variables from one. And then what you do is you define a new ideal J uh, that will be an ideal in, in two n variables that consists of taking the ideal J I taking a reduction, taking a reduction in x direction, you could ignore this part, the only interesting part is the last one, and taking a quadric. So all the deformations are contained in a quadric. Uh, and I claim that this j has essentially the same singularity type as i, and that it has all the good properties that we would like, in particular, appropriately interpreted i is an open immersion here. And here goes the open question. Um, sorry. Mm -hmm. you, you write i times k y1 over yn. Do, right. do, do you mean like um, because I live in X variables and I want to have something an ideal here. So well, I could write just ideal generated by I. Okay, okay. 
Okay, great. So an open question is the following. Uh, the, uh, I mean, the above, well, the above calculation, if I really show you the details, uh, shows that if I consider a quadric, and if I take a linear space inside this quadric, and I take, I think, it's thickening for every a greater or equal than zero. And I guess here I need three variables. Then this is uh, rigid as a projective variety. And I would be very happy to understand why. Why the thickenings of the affine space, uh, uh, yeah, of, of the, sorry, of the projective space inside the quadric are really rigid. But so you know it's true, or you believe it's? I mean, you know it's true. Oh, I know it's true because I just calculate uh, that t one is is zero, but I don't want know why is it true. I mean, my problem here is that this quadric is really a great uh, technical help, but I don't understand the, the the geometric significance. I think if I understood the geometric significance, I would be happier about those examples. Wait, and, you, you don't mean you don't mean a bigger than zero, do you? Uh, well, maybe I want a great, greater equal than one. Yeah. But we can't we just uh, rotate it around? I mean, um, what do you mean rigid? Sorry, tell me what you mean by rigid. Like an, op like an abstract variety. You can rotate it around. Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, and yeah, so, and yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. I want, yeah, I, I really need a greater equal than one because otherwise I kill the quadric and that, that doesn't make any sense. And can you say something, the, the top part of this page, it looks like this is a <laughs> clever gadget to do something. And I don't have a okay. design to do. Yeah, so this is, uh, this uh, has the properties that we want, namely it has this, well, just oversimplifying a lot. It has the singularity type of I, that's one thing. And on the other hand, uh, it uh, lies uh, in this in the good cell. So really, this map I near it is an open immersion. And you just had this inspiration that this would do that. that like... Oh, I had uh, I had one. Yeah, I, I had one hint because there is an old example I think due to. Oh man, it's a in, it's a book by August, but it's not due to August. Uh, okay, whatever. There is an example of a scheme that li that lives in over FP, which is not liftable to Z divided by P square, and this scheme has this quadric. So I I was really lucky to find this quadric in some example, and it turned out that this example generalizes is like all the way up, which is amazing. But yeah. I could explain why the technical, why this quadric is really nice technically, but I, it's really on the level of the technical things. So, uh, I guess that yeah, this I think there are may, maybe possibly many reductions, but I think that this reduction is really clean because you start from an ideal i, you really want to kill a huge power of x's and y's, so you do it, and then you add this quadric, so it's kind of the minimal way to do such an example. I think because if, yeah. Can I have like only one open question before I end? Sure, although even before you, you said a huge power of X's and Y's, but it's a huge power of Y's, but not of the X's. It's only the second power of the X's, right? Excuse me, could you repeat that? You say it's only the second power of the X's, not a huge power of the X's. Right, uh, exactly. So the X is somehow, uh, oh, it's, uh, oh man, I, I yeah. I've, the x the x's should be a huge power the y's not the y's are somehow dummy dummy variables they are just introduced to have this quadric right mm. okay yeah sorry for that so the x's are important because if i kill x's in small powers then i mess up with i and i don't want to do this okay so uh, okay so one of the examples, the Bialynski Birula implies that if I have X smooth and say projective, uh, and if it has finitely many fixed points, then I, I told you 
in the theorem that this means that you have just R fixed points. And those affine bundles then tell you that each Xi is an affine variety. And in particular, that X is rational. And even more, that X contains an affine space of dimension X. So now the open question, which I really find amazing, is the same thing for GA. Namely, you have a X smooth projective and you have uh, XGA finite, which actually means that it's a point, but whatever. And then the question is whether this implies that X uh, is a union of uh, ANs over some, uh, some points. So in particular, whether X contains an affine space to appropriate dimension. So this is actually like uh, BB decomposition the motivation for this is BB decomposition for GA. Like, I think that's that really is surprising that the decomposition for GA could have any chance of having such a result, but I couldn't find a counterexample for that, actually. And uh, importantly, this GA action frequently induces an SL2 action, and then you have a GM action, and then you have this A1 coming from the GM action. So, but still, it's kind of, it's really something that is intriguing. So you could, you could define this decomposition in the very same way as for GM. And you would like to understand whether it has the same properties for smooth varieties. And we, we couldn't find a counterexamples for that. I would imagine that counterexamples are, ab are abundant and you could just take any one, but not, it's not so. So an, op an open question is whether you can have some BB decompositions for GM. Okay, great. Then I guess that should be more or less it. Uh, I have some explicit examples for you to appreciate or not really <laughs> at the very end. And thanks a lot for listening. Great, let's let so we can all, before asking questions, we can unmute ourselves and thank Johan for, uh, for uh, uh, an enlightening and depressing talk.